Welcome and thank you for attending Black History Matters presented by the National Abolition Hall of Fame and Museum. It is my pleasure to welcome you and to lead you through some introductory statements. My name is Victoria Basuto and I am a current senior at Colgate University in Hamilton, New York, as well as an intern for the National Abolition Hall of Fame and Museum. I will be facilitating the series of 28 presentations that will be released throughout the month of February 2021 and that you can view on our YouTube channel or on our website. The National Abolition Hall of Fame and Museum is located in Peterborough, New York, in the building that you can see on the screen where the inaugural meeting of the New York State Anti-Slavery Society was held in 1835. Mehoff's mission is as follows. The National Abolition Hall of Fame and Museum honors anti-slavery abolitionists, their work to end slavery and the legacy of that struggle and strives to complete the second and ongoing abolition, the moral conviction to end racism. Nehoff has worked in coordination with the Garrett Smith Estate National Historic Landmark, also located in Peterborough, New York, in the creation of the Black History Matters series. The following statement is the purpose of Black History Matters. Nehoff supports the racial justice movement seeking to address racial inequality given the resonance with Nehoff's mission to address the second and ongoing abolition to end racism. Nehoff believes a significant number of Americans do not understand the current racial justice protests due to their unfamiliarity with four centuries of Black American history because this history was either excluded or taught inadequately in schools. Nehoff knows that education is a powerful step towards ending racism and that understanding the history of the enslavement and dehumanization of Black Americans provides critical context for the ongoing racial justice movements and the persistence of racism in America. Given Nehoff's commitment to strengthening knowledge of history as one route to confront racism, Nehoff will present Black History Matters, a series of crash courses covering some examples of neglected topics in Black American history throughout February of 2021. It is now my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Timothy McLaughlin. Dr. McLaughlin is Professor Emeritus of History at Casanova College and Vice President of the Cabinet of Freedom at the National Abolition Hall of Fame and Museum. Timothy McLaughlin served as Professor of History and Dean of the First Year Program at Casanova College in New York. His favorite course, Race, Rights and Resistance, was a seminar on Black history from the fight to end slavery to the ongoing struggle for equality within contemporary American society. Dr. McLaughlin was invited to become a member of the National Abolition Hall of Fame and Museum's Cabinet of Freedom in June 2010 and was elected vice president in 2012. He lives in Erieville, New York and St. Simons, Georgia with his wife and dog. The image that he provided of himself demonstrates him standing in front of the historical Harrington School, which he will speak more about in his presentation. I'd like to now invite Dr. McLaughlin to begin his presentation on the survival of the Gullah Geechee culture. Well, thank you for the introduction. And uh, now let's talk about the Gullah Geechee. The translation is if you don't know where you are going, then you should know where you come from. The language is Gullah, a mix of African grammar and a mostly English vocabulary spoken by the Gullah of the Carolinas and the Geechee of Georgia in Northeast Florida. Their names are a mystery. Gullah might be a version of Angola, while Geechee could be from a West African society. As a historian and seasonal resident of coastal Georgia, I've learned something of the Gullah Geechee story. In this lecture, I'll introduce them and invite you to learn more about them. The Gullah Geechee created and sustained their culture despite three formidable challenges. First, enslavement. Second, Jim Crow segregation. And third, a 20th century onslaught of economic development. Gullah artist John W. Jones' work, Gullah Island Solitude, shows how peaceful uh, life could be for the Gullah Geechee when left to themselves. The rest stops along Highway 95 in South Carolina and Georgia feature this National Park Service map of the Gullah Geechee Cultural Heritage Corridor. The corridor, set up in 2006, seeks to preserve and share the contributions of the Gullah Geechee to American history. The Park Service calls the Gullah Geechee a unique people who retain many aspects of their African heritage 
due to the geographic barriers of the coastal landscape and the strong sense of place and family of community members. The Gullah or Geechee have held on to and amalgamated the traditions of Africa with the cultures they encountered both during and after enslavement. Besides history books on the Gullah Geechee, I'm gonna draw on some personal experiences of two Georgia sea islands, Sapelo and St. Simons for this introduction. Sapelo Island to the north is remote, reached only by boat. Thomas Spaulding ran the island as a plantation before the Civil War. Afterwards, Geechee farmers bought land from his family. Until the 1960s, wealthy landholders, first Howard Coffin, then Richard J. Reynolds, own most of the island. The state of Georgia now owns 97% of the land. St. Simons is much more developed. By 1800, there were multiple plantations on the island. And after the Civil War, the Geechee worked in the lumber industry and then tourism, but primarily relied on farming their own land, fishing, and hunting. Why enslave West Africans? Well, they grew a variety of rice that plantation owners wanted to grow in coastal Georgia and South Carolina. Africans with knowledge of rice growing were therefore in high demand. In the 1750s, after slavery spread to Georgia, the Charleston firm of Austin and Lawrence alone brought over 8,000 enslaved Africans to build and cultivate new rice plantations. Survivors of this trip across the Atlantic became the ancestors of the Gullah Geechee. These posters show the continuing demand for enslaved Africans who knew how to grow rice. On the left, a sale of newly arrived Africans in the 1700s. On the right, a sale of their descendants in 1857, about a century later. Rice held its value during slave times. African resistance to enslavement took many forms. In 1803, 75 enslaved Igbos from West Africa were brought by the ship York to St. Simons from Savannah by slaveholders Thomas Spaulding and John Cooper. The Igbo rebelled and killed the ship's crew, but were trapped when the ship ran aground. Their leader convinced them to walk into Dunbar Creek at what is now Igbo Landing rather than live as slaves. Cornelia Bailey, in her book, God, Dr. Buzzard and the Bolito Man, tells how the Sapelo community of behavior got its name. She says, the people on a certain slave ship didn't want to be slaves. They were not going to be slaves. And they ran off into the woods and stayed there. And they wouldn't come out. The old slave master said, just let them stay inside that woods until they're ready to behave themselves. Don't bother them. Just take them out food and water. Just leave them alone. They eventually chose to come out and endure enslavement. Further Gullah Geechee resistance included actions ranging from sabotage of property to outright rebellion or flight. Until 1821, many fled to Spanish Florida and joined the Seminole. This 1862 Harper's Weekly engraving is of a Georgia rice plantation. You might want to pause the lecture to take a closer look at this image. Coastal plantations, like most southern plantations, ran initially on a gang system where large numbers of slaves driven by overseers worked all day in the fields. Slave resistance led coastal planters to adopt a task-based system where slaves had free time once they'd finished their work. Once the rice fields had been cleared and the flow of water regulated by irrigation systems, slaves became involved in other tasks that helped make the plantation self-sufficient. Planners and their head drivers or overseers identified the tasks and who would carry them out. Basket making is one such task still done today. Enslaved artisans did a lot to make plantations as self-sufficient as possible. After the Civil War, the Gullah Geechee grew rice only for themselves. Thomas Spaulding brought Balali Mohammed, a master of rice cultivation, to Sapelo from the Bahamas and made him his head driver in charge of roughly 400 slaves. Sali Balali from Southern Mali served a similar role in the Cannons Point Plantation on the north end of St. Simon's Island. The plantation owner, James Hamilton Cooper, said of Sali Balali, quote, his industry, intelligence, and honesty soon brought him notice. 
and he was advanced gradually until he was made head driver. Men like Bilali Muhammad and Sali Bilali provided crucial expertise and leadership. No certain image of either man exists. This is the Bilali diary, a treatise on Islamic law that Bilali Muhammad studied before enslavement and recreated from memory years later, proof of a literate Muslim presence in 19th century America. The ring shout is African, possibly Islamic in origin. Shouters move in a single line counterclockwise, stomping and clapping. Others chant verses, clap hands, or pound the ground with sticks, a substitute for the drums forbidden by slaveholders. Cornelia Bailey describes one shout as illustrating the patience associated with the buzzard who would wait for God to provide a meal. Participants imitated the movements of the buzzards waiting for their prey to die. This image is of a ring shout from the 1930s. The inset is from a 2018 performance by the McIntosh County Shouters on St. Simons Island. This group has performed for audiences around the United States since 1980. This clip that I'm gonna play from their 2011 performance is from the Library of Congress in Washington, DC. Uh, the song is Read Him John, when the only literate slave on the plantation reads a letter confirming they are free. Small buildings called praise houses were built, originally on the outskirts of plantations, where groups of a dozen or so Gullah Geechee could get together to pray, sing, and reflect. 1865 was a critical point in Gullah Geechee history. After meeting with black ministers, General Sherman published Special Field Order Number 15 that gave freedmen 40 acres of land, not mules. The order applied to the Sea Islands and 30 miles inland from Charleston to Northern Florida, a sizable chunk of the Gullah Geechee homeland. Eric Foner in his book, Reconstruction, America's Unfinished Revolution, said that here in coastal South Carolina and Georgia, the prospect beckoned of a transformation of Southern society, more radical even than the end of slavery. However, President Andrew Johnson returned these lands to pre-war white owners. Without land, Black Americans faced repression and resurgent racism from a position of economic weakness. So the second challenge for the Gullah Geechee was to survive the oppressive Jim Crow system that spread across the South. Solitude proved to be their buffer against the worst of white repression. Whites thought of the region as economically isolated, miserably hot, with plentiful diseases and obnoxious animal life. Under these circumstances, the Gullah Geechee could buy land for farming while hunting and fishing on whites unused land. African and American customs, language and beliefs continued to develop into a unique mix. The Gullah Geechee grew their own rice until Louisiana rice became cheap enough to replace the homegrown version. Cornelia Bailey's mother grew the family's rice on Sapelo until the 1950s when she could buy a hundred pound bag of Louisiana of rice for eight bucks that would last a whole year. Gullah artist John W. Jones in his Low Country Gullah series depicts Gullah Geechee life. His work is available online and at the gallery Chuma in Charleston. 
Men and women used homemade cast nets to gather food from the tidal creeks. Few women, and not all of the men, knew how to swim, but they spent a lot of time on the water anyway. Tides are fierce and riptides are common on the island, so fishing was very dangerous. Cornelia Bailey describes three kinds of nets used on Sapelo. Shrimp nets had a tight three-quarter inch mesh and took a long time to make. Nets with a one inch mesh were called a poor man's net that held just about anything that would get you a quick meal. Mullet nets had a wide weave, two inches, and were quickest to make. If you were lucky, that could get you a real feast. This is another Gullah Geechee painting by John Jones. This woman at the city market in Charleston is making a sweetgrass basket. Both men and women make and market a wide variety of baskets. Baskets originally were used in processing rice and now are sold mostly to tourists. Sweetgrass is getting harder to obtain these days as development swallows the areas where the plant traditionally was harvested. Chemical pollutants have also done great harm. Cultural survivals such as basket maving, making are Africanisms, linking the Gullah Geechee to West Africa. Similar baskets are still made in most West African countries. I showed a basket made on Saplo Island to a colleague back home. She looked at, at it and said she'd learned how to make the same kind of basket from her husband, an immigrant from Sierra Leone. Andy Tate's Dr. Buzzard's Hoodoo series is associated with the legendary Dr. Buzzard, AKA Stephanie Robinson of St. Helena's Island. Tate's gallery is in Beaufort, South Carolina. According to Cornelia Bailey, Dr. Buzzard was the root doctor, the conjurer, the worker of black magic. He could put a spell on you and do you bodily harm. Sadie Riles talked about the less dangerous use of herbs for he healing purposes. Sea islands either had the same plants as in West Africa or ones of similar appearance that could be adopted for use as medicine. Life everlasting was and is used for illnesses from asthma to influenza. A bottle tree in the yard trapped haints. The Gullah Geechee believed body, soul, and spirit parted after death. Sometimes the spirits could go astray and become an evil haint rather than a helping family spirit. Language is another link between Africa and the Gullah Geechee. Joseph Apala, who proved the Gullah Geechee connection to West Africa, describes the Gullah language as an English-based Creole language. The vocabulary is largely English, but African influences have altered their pronunciation, influenced the grammar and sentence structure, and provided a sizable minority of the vocabulary. These proverbs and phrases show the Gullah Geechee sense of humor. My teaching assistant thought the second proverb described some of our first year students. Estimates of current Gullah Geechee speakers range from 100,000 to 500,000. Children of Gullah Geechee who moved away from the region traditionally return in the summer and thus retain their family language. Gullah, such as these proverbs and phrases, is a lot easier, for me at least, to read rather than hear. The sample of spoken Gullah Geechee is a YouTube recording of a storyteller recorded outside Charleston talking about Br'er Rabbit, Br'er Fox, and Santa Claus. And pray for the fox don't catch him this year Christmas night. So I lock up good fashion. And when I turn around, down the chimney come but a fox. That old sinkful old hound, and then he the cat. Good rat there, rabbit. Uh, I figure for sure I'd boy catch him this time before he get out the door. Now, I know about a fox is a very soon man. So I could try for hold him as long as I can. Forgive Sandy Kind for going on his way, so the children have present come Christmas Day. So I holler to mama, come here quick and talk to Butter Fox while I go for one technique. I look at these spit down the road so fast, I get to the next house for a minute down past. I bust open the door and I holler to Sandy, Butter Fox, do we house and he got yam all the candy? Sandy called Butter Rabbit, take your foot in his hand. I clear the little rabbit's a fast little man. Now I going back to me house, think about a fox done escape. He's still there talking to mama about the sour grape. He make him manners though, that sly old dandy. Then he teeth the chillin' apple, they skyrocket and they candy.
Religious practices became more visible following emancipation. The Gullah Geechee built churches, usually Baptist or African Methodist Episcopalian in all of their communities. St. Luke seen here is right across the way from the first African Baptist church rebuilt in Hog Hammock when the Raccoon Bluff community on the north end of Sapelo was forced to move in the 1950s by white landowner, R.J. Reynolds. Churches are the center points of Gullah Geechee communities. Ministers and even more so deacons and deaconesses have a lot to say about family affairs, including marriages, raising children and disciplining teenagers. The cash economy on St. Simons after the Civil War relied on timber mills and later resorts that provided employment to islanders. The Gullah Geechee on St. Simons combined subsistence farming with jobs that provided necessary cash. The Dodge Mill at Gascoigne Bluff that you see here ran from the 1870s until the turn of the century and at its peak was the third largest mill in the country. Completion of the Ocean Pier on the southern tip of St. Simons in 1887 led to construction of a hotel and boarding houses for tourists and summer cabins for nearby mainlanders. The black community of South End housed workers at the resort and servants of visiting white families. Investor Howard Coffin purchased a large, large part of St. Simons just after completion of the causeway. His Sea Island Investments Company built a golf course on retreat plantation west of the pier that engulfed the plantation and the Geechee's burying ground. Later, the Sea Island Company sold housing lots on what had been the plantation. In 1928, Coffin's company opened the exclusive Cloister Hotel on Sea Island, just north of St. Simon's that you see here, still in business today. Tourism provided jobs for the Geechee in hotels, restaurants, and golf courses. However, they lost access to fishing and hunting areas they'd used for generations. Eventually, they would also lose most of their land. The first version of the Torres Causeway between the mainland and St. Simon's Island was completed in 1924. On the day that it opened, 5,500 cars crossed over to St. Simon's and 7,500 people were fed a fish dinner under some live oak trees, quite a crowd. The causeway has since been rebuilt twice and expanded to four lanes. Howard Coffin and other investors moved in thanks to the causeway. The subsequent loss of land threatened to destroy Geechee communities on the island, especially from the 1950s onward. Most of all, local government agencies cooperated with the land developers looking to invest in what they called the Golden Isles. Black businessman Willis Proctor had a grocery store in the front of this house and lived in the back. Earlier in his career, he'd managed a hotel dining room and worked as a valet to one of the Rockefellers. Other family businesses included a fruit stand, fish market, and nightclub. The family lived on Proctor Lane, but one day without notice, the street name was changed to Mallory and the county allowed a white owned convenience store to go in next door. Without access to the planning process, little could be done. So many developers circulated in black communities from World War II onwards, asking to buy homes and businesses that people put up don't ask, won't sell signs. From the Civil War through the Jim Crow era, the Gullah Geechee lived in isolated communities with limited outside interaction. Like most Black Americans, they seldom managed to build capital. When St. Simon's land values rose, a replacement cycle started that pushed them off island. Here is roughly how it works. First, property values go up as resorts, houses, and businesses are built. Second, Black property owners must pay higher taxes or sell up and move to the mainland. Then third, owners sell buildings due to taxes or a need for ready cash. And fourth, more resorts, houses, and businesses are built and the cycle repeats itself. The people of Sapelo went through a similar experience and got little for their tax payments. No paved roads, no sewers, no police, no garbage collectors, and no schools. Their money goes to pay for official salaries on the mainland. Opportunities also led Gullah Geechee families off island. Jim Brown lived in this house with his great grandmother as a child. His father left, then his mother moved to Long Island and found work there. His mom sent for him when he was eight. In a 1960 Sports Illustrated interview, 
Brown fondly described his childhood on St. Simon's. I guess we were supposed to be poor, but we weren't poor. We had all the crab and fish and vegetables that we could eat. The house was small and weather beaten, but hell, I lived well because there was so much family there, a whole community of people who cared about each other. Like other Gullah Geechee, he still came back south each summer to stay with family. He re kept returning even after becoming a star for Syracuse University and then the Cleveland Browns. Nevertheless, he and so many others left home. Alan Bailey left Sapelo Island to play football at McIntosh County High School and the University of Miami before becoming a pro with Kansas City Chiefs. He currently plays with the Atlanta Hawks. Until her passing in 2017, Cornelia Bailey, a descendant of Bilali Muhammad, led the Sapelo Geechee community in their fight for survival. She also wrote the book on Geechee culture that I've mentioned several times, God, Dr. Buzzard, and the Bolito Man. Her stories are a great way to learn more about the Gullah Geechee. The Heritage Coalition raises money through events such as the annual Sea Island Festival, basically a big party. White residents show their support through financial contributions and attending presentations at Harrington School. Because many of St. Simon's Black residents come from off island, the coalition focuses on a common African American heritage while acknowledging their community's Gullah Geechee roots. Amy Roberts, the coalition's executive director, guided us through St. Simon's when we first arrived. Her new book is on the Gullah Geechee heritage of St. Simon's. My first guide on Sapelo Island, Chuck Evans, left the island to earn a master's degree. His mother left earlier to become an English professor. She moved back to Sapelo to be with her cousin and our guide followed later. When I met him, he lived across the way from Cornelia Bailey, who was helping him learn more stories about island life. Kinship is a key to holding together the Geechee. Tours are a way to earn money, either as a state employee or as an independent business person. Getting school kids to visit is a way to educate the outside world about Sapelo's Gullah Geechee community. The Grab All Country store shown behind our guide is the only convenience store on the island. Next door is the Trough, the only bar. The St. Simon's African American Heritage Coalition led by Amy Roberts and the Friends of Harrington School raised $300,000 to renovate Harrington School, a two room schoolhouse built by the local community in 1925 with assistance from Anson Dodge, an Episcopal minister whose brother owned the Dodge lumber mill. The school is a near replica of the Rosenwald schools built around the South in the early 1900s by Julius Rosenwald the Jewish American president of Sears Roebuck and Company and Booker T. Washington, president of the Tuskegee Institute. The school is now a community center and museum. The Gullah Geechee have demonstrated over the years cultural resilience and adaptability in facing the challenges of enslavement, Jim Crow segregation and the surge of economic development. The Gullah Geechee are fighting hard for survival through preservation and use of their historical sites, legal struggles to hold on to their land, and revived use of their language, especially by children. The Gullah Geechee are working to gain allies on the national, state, and local levels. Examples include the Gullah Geechee Cultural Heritage Corridor, the Friends of Harrington School, Sapelo Island Cultural and Revitalization Society, and the educational tours they give of Sapelo and St. Simons. I'd like to thank Dr. McLaughlin for that educational presentation. If you're interested in learning more about this topic, Dr. McLaughlin has provided a reference list of sources with websites that you can explore to learn more. This reference list will be linked beneath the video in the video description and the bibliography where all of the presentation sources will be made available on NAHOP's website. I will invite you to fill out a quick survey link beneath the video in the description, which will help us gather feedback about this specific topic. The survey will take you no more than five minutes to fill out and will provide us with valuable information that will help us in the formation of future presentations like this one. Lastly, should you have any questions regarding the presentation itself, Dr. McLaughlin has made his email available so that you may contact him with questions or comments you may have. 
Additionally, please do contact Neha for any questions or if you're interested in learning more about the organization and its work. Neha's contact information is on the screen. Once again, I'd like to thank Dr. McLaughlin for providing a program for the Black History Matters 2021 series. I would also like to thank you, the audience, for joining us on this educational journey. I hope to see you at our future presentations. Thank you.